This special pre-Shavuos Parshas Bamidbar podcast is dedicated in honor of the real heroes of Torch, the ones who support our organization with weekly or monthly ongoing donations. The hardest thing in the world to raise money for is for Torah. You want to open up a museum. You want to save the whales. It's easy to raise funds. The hardest thing is for Torah. And that's during regular times. Of course, now we're in a complete economic shutdown. And during this unprecedented time, how much harder is it to raise finances to support Torah? And we have monthly and weekly ongoing donors. And this episode is in their honor. They are the true partners in helping Torch do what we do. And we want to thank them, of course, for their support. If you want to join this rarefied class, this princely fraternity, this elevated, exalted group of ongoing partners that help support us on an ongoing basis, please visit our website, torchweb.org. There's an option when you make a donation to make it ongoing, make it weekly. Of course, you can always email me. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Today, we're going to experiment with something new, something interesting, a little bit different, maybe a bit mind-bending. I want to warn you, it might get slightly technical, but it's worth it. That's my guarantee. Parshas Bamidbar is always the Parsha that we read immediately prior to Shavuos, to Shavuot, to the festival that's going to take place next week, the festival of the giving of the Torah. And because they are always juxtaposed in the calendar, there's got to be a connection between the Parsha, Parshas Bamidbar, and between the upcoming festival, Shavuos. And of course, as you could bet, there are many different answers. So for example, a very important principle of the Torah is quoted by a bunch of the commentaries. And they say, hey, the Parsha begins that the Almighty speaks to the Jewish people, to Moses, Bamidbar, which means in the Midbar, in the wilderness. And the commentaries quote the Talmud in the book of Erevin, page 54b, that tells us that the only way for someone to absorb, to acquire Torah, is if they make themselves akin to a wilderness, to a desert. Only if a person makes himself like a desert, like a wilderness, that everyone tramples over, that everyone threshes, that everyone treads over, only then does their Torah endure. But if not, their Torah does not endure. And this is actually part of a series of teachings along these lines. For example, the Talmud tells us on the very, the very same page, the Talmud says that a person has to make themselves so humble, like a garden bed upon which everyone treads. And some make themselves like spices that everyone can enjoy. And only if you have that combination of dedication to Torah, namely that you want to make others enjoy, and you're willing to suffer the humiliation of other people treading over you, you're willing to humble yourself, you're willing to absorb a little bit of pain, only then can you actually acquire Torah. Similarly, the Talmud in the book of Sota, page 21b, tells us that the words of Torah only endure within someone who makes themselves naked over it, i.e., that they're willing to make themselves vulnerable. They're willing to risk everything for Torah. Continues the Talmud. Torah is only fulfilled within someone who negates themselves and makes themselves as if they don't exist. Only a person who has that commitment to Torah is going to be a worthy, enduring receptacle of the great gift that we have from God. Talmud in the book of Brachos, page 63b, Torah is only fulfilled, Torah only endures within someone who dies over it, who's willing to give up everything for it, only then do you have Torah. Again, this is a sampling of many of the teachings that we find in the Talmud along these lines. And the common theme of these teachings is that in order to acquire Torah, you have to be willing to forfeit something. You have to give something up. You have to make yourselves like a wilderness, willing to suffer perhaps a little bit of humiliation, willing to forfeit some honor, some comfort, not being bashful. The Talmud says that if someone is bashful, if someone's embarrassed, they won't learn. You have to overcome your tendency to be shy 
in order to study. You can't say, hey, what will others say? Oh, I need to catch up on my television shows. It's really hard to understand initially. My phone, scrolling on my phone gives me quicker dopamine hits. There's a million excuses if someone wants to do other stuff besides for Torah. In order for someone to get Torah, you have to give up something. You have to forfeit. You have to make yourself like a desert. Negate yourself over it. Break your bad habits and open up yourself for Torah. And I think there's another point here. When someone is absorbing Torah, in effect what they're doing is they're upgrading their intellect. You know, we start off life and the Yetzirah the evil Kanesha is in charge. And the whims and the habits and the mores of society are present, are squatting within our mind. And what we're trying to do, what we're encountering, embracing Torah, we're trying to swap out, so to speak, the rules that govern the way we see the world. Our Weltanschauung, our worldview, our perspectives, and we're upgrading. Okay, now we're going to have the mind of God, so to speak. When someone becomes a bona fide Torah scholar, in effect, they have harmonized their mind, their outlook, with Torah, and consequently with God's mind. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to depart from the mind, from the perspectives that dominated your life previously. You have to walk away from something in order to adopt the new you that's dominated by God and his Torah. So, of course, it is a fitting introduction to the festival of Shavuos that we're told, again, the very first verse of our parasha, that there's something that's happening in the wilderness. Torah is when someone makes themselves in the wilderness. They humble themselves. They negate themselves. They're willing to subject their will to the Almighty's will to be the receptacles of his Torah. That's one idea that's quoted by our sages, by the commentaries, as to understanding what the connection between the Parsha and the upcoming festival is. Today I want to suggest another approach, and this is where it might get a little bit mind-bending. So I want to begin with an interesting question. Of course, on Shavuos, the original Shavuos, the nation is coalesced around the mountain, and they experience what no other nation in history, not before, not since, experienced. They have prophecy from God, and they hear the Ten Commandments. And afterwards, of course, Moshe goes up, spends 40 days, comes back down. Jewish people send the golden calf. He smashes the first set of tablets. After 40 days of praying, God says, okay, I'll give you a second set of tablets. And then 120 days after the original ascent at Sinai, Moshe comes back down. This is the third time, and he gives the Jewish people the second set of tablets that were almost identical to the first tablets, the first tablets were written by God, but also produced by God. Second set of tablets are produced by Moses, and God inscribes upon the tablets the same thing that he inscribed in the first set of tablets, namely the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments, they are found twice in the Torah. First, they are found in Exodus chapter 20, and that is in the narrative of the Exodus, Jewish people leave Egypt, and 50 days later, they're at Sinai, and they get the Torah. They get the experience of the tetragram, of the Ten Commandments. Now, in Deuteronomy, this is about a month before Moshe's passing, he is recounting what happened. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he retells the story of the Sinai experience and the Ten Commandments. Now, the problem is, if you look at commandment number four of the ten, this is the one that orients around the Shabbat. But there is a very distinct difference between the words found in Exodus and the words found in Deuteronomy. In Exodus, it says, Zachar Yom HaShabbos Lekatsho, remember the day of Shabbos to sanctify it. You go to Deuteronomy chapter five, this is verse 12. It doesn't say Zachar es Yom HaShabbos Likacho. It says Shamar es Yom HaShabbos Likacho. Instead of saying, remember the Shabbos of St. Deviat, it says, observe, Shamar, observe, guard the Shabbos to St. Deviat. The word Zachar and the word Shamar are different words with different meanings. So what did God say during the Ten Commandments revelation? What did he say at Sinai? Was it Zachar or was it Shamar? So if you look at Rashi, 
in both places, Rashi already addresses the question. And he tells us, well, this is a prophetic experience. And prophetic experiences are different than normal experiences. And normally, if I'm conveying a message to you, I could say either Zachar or Shamar, either remember or observe, guard. But at Sinai, the nation experienced something unique. They experienced prophecy. And both the word Zachar and the word Shamar were said simultaneously at the same time. And were both heard at the same time. Normal people can do that. Your ear can hear it. Your mouth can not speak it. But this is not a normal conversation. It's supernatural. It's miraculous. It's prophetic. And therefore, Zachar and Shamar are told simultaneously. That's what Rashi says in both places. Quotes from the, from the Talmud, from the Midrash. That's the answer. But if you think about it, there's still a question. Yes, at Sinai, when the nation actually heard the Ten Commandments, God, in the ways that we can understand, okay, it's prophecy, God said Zachar and Shamar together in a way that's not possible for normal humans to, to experience or to understand or to articulate. But 40 days later, Moshe comes down with a set of tablets. On the set of tablets, it says the Ten Commandments. And of course, the first set was broken. And then a couple, day, couple of months later, he brings down the second set of tablets, which were not broken. And on these tablets, both the first that were destroyed and the second, and the second ones that were not destroyed, both of them had, had the Ten Commandments on it. What did it say under the entry of the fourth of the Ten Commandments? Did it say Zachar or did it say Shamar? It's not possible to write them both. So maybe at the time when there was prophecy, there was some sort of supernatural experience. But subsequently, what did it actually say on the tablets? That's the question I want to pose. And I want to ask another question, which will help us get to maybe an answer. Our parsha begins, Bamidbar, you count the Jewish people. And we go through the various tribes. And the people are uplifted, as the verse says. They're counted by Moshe and Aaron. Everyone gives a coin. And eventually we count the coins. And this is not the first time it happened. It happened in Exodus chapter 12. Rashi tells us it happened a few times throughout the Torah. The nation is counted. Now what's interesting is that when the nation's counted, the final tally is remarkably the same, despite the fact that it's being taken under various times, meaning the nation is counted right when they left, and we're told in Exodus chapter 12 that the final tally was 600,000 people. In Numbers chapter 11, again, Moshe makes the proclamation that there is 600,000 people. Now, in our Parsha, chapter 1 of, of Numbers, the final tally is a little bit more but it seems like there's some power to this particular number, 600,000, and the nation, so to speak, sticks to being that size. Now, the Zohar tells us something very interesting. The Zohar says that Moshe, not only did he count the Jewish people, he also counted the letters of the Torah. And you know what he discovered? The Jewish people were 600,000, and the letters of the Torah they were also 600,000. And there's a perfect match. Jewish people, the nation, 600,000. And then you have the Torah, also 600,000. 600,000 souls of the Jewish people and 600,000 letters of the Torah. And by the way, the Ramchal, Ramosh Chaim Lutzato, he has an essay, a treatise called Derech Chaim, and this is how he starts off. There's a match. There is a uniformity. There is a parallel between the Jewish people and the Torah. Now, the Kabbalists, they add that the name of our nation, we're called the Jewish people, but we're called the Israelites, the nation of Israel, or Yisrael, which is, of course, the name that Jacob was given originally by the angel and subsequently by God. Jacob is called both Jacob and Israel. The Jewish nation is called the nation of Israel. So the Kabbalists tell us that the acronym of the word Yisrael, Israel, is Yesh Shishim Ribui Osos Torah. There are 600,000 letters in the Torah. And that's what the Jewish people are. There's a match. Jewish people, 600,000 souls, and the Torah says 100,000 letters. The problem is, is that the math does not check out. 
if you were to take a Torah scroll or take a Chumash, a book of the Torah, and you start counting meticulously every letter from the first letter of the Torah, Bereshis Baralokim, until the very last verse of the book of Deuteronomy, Lein Kal Yisrael, and you make sure you don't skip a letter, you don't count the letter twice, you do a perfect job, you'll discover that the tally is not quite 600,000 letters. In fact, the number that you'll come up with is 304,805 letters. The Zohar, the Kabbalists, they promised us there's 600,000 letters in the Torah, but we're missing 295, 195,000. About half of them were missing. It's an unbelievable problem. It sounds like the Kabbalists, they're pulling a fast one. They hope that no one would check. Now we have computers, and now we could do all the math instantly. We know for sure that the 600,000 letters of the Torah, that figure, is stunningly off. It's 50% off. How could it be that the Zohar tells us, Moshe counts the Jewish people, 600,000. He counts the letters of the Torah, also 600,000. And yet we discover that the actual number is only 304,000. 805. So there's a lot of answers to this question. So for example, some speculate that the Torah is more than just the black ink. There's also the parchment, the white parchment upon which a Torah scroll was written. And you can't just count the black ink. You also have to count the white parchment upon which the black ink is written. And in fact, the Talmud tells us that before the Torah was given at Sinai, from the heavenly abode to the, to the Jewish people below, when the Torah was in heaven and, he, in, and there alone, not brought down to terra firma, in that state, says the Talmud, the Torah was black fire atop white fire. And what that teaches us is that the Torah, it's not just the black ink, it's also the white parchment, that's also part of the Torah. So maybe... If we could figure out a way to count the white space, it's not clear how that would actually work. If if we could count it, maybe that would make up for the missing 295 plus thousand letters. That's one suggestion. A second suggestion tells us to look at the Targum. The Targum is the officially sanctioned translation of the Torah. And at Sinai, we're told in the sources, we got the Torah written in Hebrew. And we also got the Targum, which is the translation into Aramaic. And even though that was only translated many, many centuries later, it's also part of the Sinai experience on some level. And therefore, that has to also be counted. And maybe if you add those letters, it's going to give you to closer to the figure. The problem is, is that, well, the Targum is actually wordier than the Torah, and therefore you're going to end up with a lot more than 600,000, because if there's 304,000, uh, plus letters in the Hebrew side, there's going to be more on the Aramaic side. But that's one, another suggestion. Others say, well, there are some letters that you don't pronounce. Maybe you count the vowels. Maybe you look at the letters not of the Torah, but the letters of the Aleph Beis. And if you really know how to count them with all their Kabbalistic permutations, you discover that the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet actually equal 600,000. There's many different answers and today we're going to suggest a new answer. Now, I want to stress that I'm not the first one to come up with it. But I did look for someone to make the calculation, and I did not find anyone else making the calculation. So the idea is found in other sources, but I believe, again, to the best of my knowledge, no one's actually done the exact calculation that you're about to hear. And here's the core idea. The idea is that every letter in the Torah, or most letters in the Torah, you could actually break a letter down into composite letters. So, for example, this idea is found in the in the halachas, in the laws governing how to write a Torah scroll. We're told, for example, that an aleph, aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and this is probably more helpful if you know what the Hebrew alphabet looks like, if you get a chance to, to look at a picture of what a Torah scroll looks like, or if you know what it looks like, it, it's easier to visualize this. But an Aleph, it's actually, on some level, it's a 
composite of three other letters. How so? You have a vav. A vav is basically a straight line. And the vav is lying horizontally or diagonally going from the top left to the bottom right. And that's sort of the spine of the olive. And then on top of it, you have a yud. And then on bottom of it, you also have a yud. And that creates an olive. So, of course, an olive is its own letter. But on some level, an olive is a composite of three other letters. The vav that spans its length diagonally. The yud that goes on top and the yud that goes on bottom. Similarly, the letter, the letter bays, second letter, or bet, it's a resh, and it's got a vav on the bottom. Or the letter chet, or ches, different ways to pronounce it. It's two zions that are connected. And this idea, by the way, is already found in the Talmud. It's brought down by some of the, the later commentators, but it's actually found in the Talmud in the book of Shabbos, page 104a. It's a very interesting teaching in the Talmud, a whole page talking about the letters and the names of the letters and what the letters represent. And if you ever have the privilege of studying a little bit of the Kabbalistic literature, the idea that the letters contain secrets that are not immediately apparent and certainly don't translate, that's one of the central ideas of how to plumb the depths of Torah. So the Talmud, for example, says that the letter for tzaddik, which is uh, the letter that makes the tz sound, that the word tzvi or tzipor or tzipora, it starts with a tzaddik. And the letter tzaddik says the Talmud, it's a bending nun that has a yud on top of it. In fact, the, the ancient sages and the Kabbalists, they talk about, hey, you know, we know that the goal of a Jew is to become a tzaddik. Tzaddik means a righteous person. And then you have a letter in the Torah, or one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, that the name of the letter is a tzaddik. Why would that letter above all the other letters be called a tzaddik? And here's the answer. A tzaddik, on this level, is a composite letter. It is a nun that's bending down. And the nun is, at least in the Talmud's eyes, it is synonymous with someone who is ne'eman, someone who is trustworthy. And on top of the back of this crouching nun, you have a yud. A yud is a reference to another Jew or another yid, which is a name for the Jew. Yehuda, for example, the Jewish people are called Judah. And that starts with a yud. And you have a tzaddik is someone who's crouching, who's bending down to carry another Jew on his back. And therefore, even though, like we mentioned earlier, the Aleph, the first of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it too is carrying a Yud on its back. It's that Vav going diagonally up, and up on top of it, there's another Yud. But the problem is that an Aleph is not a Tzaddik. Because while it is carrying another Yud on its back, it's also trampling upon a Yud which is under it. And therefore, this is again the sages and the Kabbalists talking, therefore the letter tzaddik is the one that's a tzaddik because the image, the picture of the letter tzaddik is a nun that's bending down with a yod on top of it. So this is the idea. The idea is that some letters, they're just letters. There's no composite, like a yod. If you've seen what a yod looks like, a yud is not made up of any other letters. A vav is not made, of, made up of any other letters. A zion. These are not composite letters. But the aleph, of course, it's its own letter in its own right. But if you break it down to the various parts that make up the aleph, you actually end up with three distinct letters that are melded together to create the letter aleph. And therefore, here's the calculation. Every time it says aleph in the Torah, of course, on one level, it's just one letter. But on a deeper level, it's really three letters that make up this one Aleph. And at Tzaddik, it's, it's really two letters that make up that particular letter. So here's the math. What's the frequency of the appearance of letters in the Torah? So, of course, most people don't know, don't know this off the top of their head. Even people who are absolute experts in the Torah. Because, of course, you know the letters are not evenly distributed. And we resort to the help of computers to figure this out. So here's the answer. 
The Aleph appears 27,057 times in the Torah. The letter Bet, or, or Base appears 16,344 times in the Torah. Gimel, 2109. Dalit, 7032. Hey, is pretty popular, 28,052. Vav, 30,509. The most frequently appearing letter of the Torah is the Yud, clocking in at 31,522. And so, so that's the most. And then you have the least, and that is the letter Tet, the ninth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, appearing 1,802 times in the Torah. So there's a list of all the 22 letters in the Torah and how frequently they appear in the Torah. Now, if we were to kind of add the idea that some letters are composite letters, and then we multiply that number of each letter, so like the Aleph, we said it's three. It's a Yud, a Vav, and a Yud. So we take the 27,057 Alephs in the Torah, and we multiply it by three. Every time there is an Aleph that appears in the Torah, that gives us not 27,057 letters, because on this level... It's giving us 81,171 letters, which is three times the number of Alephs that appear in the Torah. Now, the letter Bet, the second letter of the Torah, it appears 16,344 times in the Torah. And each Bet we said is two letters on the composite level, and that gives us 32,688, and so on. A Gimel is a Vav, and it has a Yud appendage to it on the bottom. And the 2109 appearances of the Gimel of the Torah... On this level, on the composite letter level, give us 4218. A Dalit, similarly, it's two letters, makes up, two letters make it up. 7032, that's the amount of appearances of Dalit on the Torah, times two, gives us a little more than 14,000. If we do this whole math, figure out each letter in the Torah, what are the letters that make up it? Or what are the letters that are the building blocks to create the new composite letter? And then we multiply each letter by how many times it appears in the Torah, times how many letters make up it, or make it up. So, of course, letter Yud, Yud is not a composite letter. So the 31,522 times that appears in the Torah, that's only going to give us 31,522, 31,522, because there's no composites that make, them, that, make, that make up that letter. But, for example, the letter Shin, the second to last, the penultimate letter in the Hebrew alphabet, that's actually three different letters. It's a Vav and then two Zions. And therefore, the 15,592 times that that appears in the Torah, actually on the composite level, on the composite letter level, gives us 46,776. So what is the final tally if we do all this math? The final tally, you'll be happy to hear, is very close to the number that we need to get to. The final tally, and this has been double-checked, that this I believe this is accurate, is 599,990. Exactly 10 letters shy of the number that we're told in the Zohar and the number we're told in the ancient Kabbalists of how many letters appear in the Torah. So I could probably take a victory lap right now and say, okay, the math checks out. You know, 599,990, it's within it's within striking distance. It's only 10 letters away. Okay, don't get so nitpicky about it. It's, it's close enough. We could call that safely 600,000. But here's my suggestion. How can we discover another 10 letters in the Torah? So this is a question I thought about a lot. I thought maybe, you know, there's some places in the Torah, if you look at the Torah scroll, that there are dots on top or below letters. And if there were maybe 10 dots, we'd have an, our answer. But the problem is there's actually not 10 dots. There's 31 different dots in a Torah scroll. So here's what I came up with. If you look at the very first verse in the Torah, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and the very first word in the Torah, the word beratius in the beginning, and the very first letter in the Torah, the Bez, or the letter Bet, of the word Bereshit. If you look in the Torah scroll, you'll find that the letter Bet is enlarged. The rest of that word, the word, the Bereshit, 
the part of the word that spells reshit, that's ordinary size letters. But the bays or the bet, the first letter is big. And in every Torah scroll, it's the same. And in fact, if you look at many editions of Chumash, you'll find that the Chumash actually prints it with an enlarged letter. And what we discover is that there's exactly 10 verses in the Torah that have large letters. Genesis 1, 1, Exodus 34, 7, Exodus 34, 14, Leviticus 11, 42, Leviticus 13, 33, Numbers 14, 17, Numbers 27, 5, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Deuteronomy 29, 27, and finally Deuteronomy 32, 6. So maybe we have an answer. Every time there's a big letter, because, you know, there's the letter itself, but then the Almighty tells Moshe, write it a little bit big, maybe we could count each one of those letters an additional time. And therefore, the word Bereshit, of course, there's the word Bereshit, but then there is the additional instruction, we'll make the bet or the base of that word, make it big, and therefore, we have an additional letter. Maybe we have a solution. Maybe that's how we make up our missing 10 letters. But that was a little bit of a trick. Because I said that there are 10 verses that have big letters. And the reason why it's a trick is because Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 6, verse 4, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, maybe the most famous verse in the whole Torah, actually has two letters that are big. The last letter of the word Shema, the Ayin, and the last word of, and the last letter of the word Echad, the Dalet, are both big. Oh no, we have 11 letters that are big. So if we have 599,990 letters in the Torah, again, using this composite calculation, and then we add another letter for enlargement of letters in the Torah, well, that gives us 600,001. And that's close, but that's not exactly the number we were promised. We have an extra letter. What do we do about it? So here's my suggestion. By the way, this is still a work in progress. I actually did this calculation once, and it turns out the calculation was slightly off. So I had to reinvent it. So this is all subject uh, for reanalysis. And if someone has a better solution to these problems, let me know. And of course, if you would like to see the actual calculation, you can email me, and I'm going to try to put in the show notes, in the description of the podcast, put some of the pictures and imagery to make it a little bit uh, easier to follow, including the calculations, uh, etc. Here's my solution. How do we get rid of that extra letter to make the calculation perfect? If you look at Numbers 25-12, this is the beginning of Parshas Pinchas. Pinchas was someone who acted very heroically in a fit of zealotry And he saved the Jewish people from a plague that was caused by a terrible event that was happening. And Pinchas is a grandson of Aaron. Aaron the high priest, Aaron Moshe's brother, has a son, Elazar, and Pinchas is the son of Elazar. So Pinchas ben Elazar, Pinchas son of Elazar, son of Aaron, the high priest. And the verse tells us that as a result of Pinchas's zealotry, he is going to be promoted. and He's going to be made into a Kohen. Now you may ask the question, wait a minute. If his grandfather is Aaron the Kohen, well, wouldn't he already be, pardon the pun, grandfathered in? He would be a Kohen just by right, by birthright. Well, the answer is not exactly. Because when Aaron and Aaron's four sons, of course, two of them subsequently died, but when Aaron, Aaron's four sons were anointed and were made into a Kohen, and that of course appears in the book of Leviticus, their subsequent sons, the sons that are born after that, they become Kohanim, they become priests. Whereas the sons that existed prior, like Pinchas, Pinchas was already born at that time, he was not anointed, and therefore he had no way to be a Kohen. He wasn't anointed, and he wasn't born to a Kohen after the Kohen was anointed. His father was a regular Levite at the time of his birth. So therefore, Pinchas was not a Kohen. However, there's a special exception here made for Pinchas. Because of his heroism, because of his zealotry, 
Pinchas is made into a Kohen. And the verse reads, L'chein amar, therefore, say, therefore you say, this is God telling Moshe, because of Pinchas' gallantry and willing to endanger himself to go stand up for God's honor, he is going to be made into a Kohen. Therefore say, and this is the verse 25, 12 of Numbers, I am going to give him my covenant of peace. Brisi Shalom. Now if you look at a Torah scroll, and in many editions of Chumash, if, when it brings the verses, again, 25, 12 of the book of Numbers, that last word of that verse, Shalom, peace, you look at the Vav, which is the third of the four letters of that particular word, Shalom. That Vav is cut up. There is a line of white space that cuts through the bottom of that Vav. And this, by the way, appears in the Talmud. Every Torah scroll that, you, that you've seen, if it's a kosher Torah scroll, it actually has the Vav cut up. And this is the only place in the Torah that there is a letter that is deliberately cut up. In fact, if there is a letter that's cut up, you're missing a letter, and you don't have a letter, and if the Torah scroll is missing one letter, the entire Torah scroll is invalidated. And here, by design, you have to almost, so to speak, invalidate this particular vav, this letter. It's cut up, and the word spells shalom, which means peace, but says the Talmud, really what the verse says, or what the word says, shalem, that's what the word would spell if it didn't have the vav. And says the Talmud, why does it say shalem as opposed to shalom? Because the word shalem means complete. And Pinchas is being made into a Kohen, and a Kohen has to be complete in order for them to be valid, to be qualified for doing work in the temple. But if they're missing a limb, if they're crippled in some way, if they don't have all their limbs, if they're not shalem, then they are disqualified. Well, the Talmud's telling us, fascinating insight. It says shalom, but the vav of the word shalom is cut off, and you have to discount that particular letter. It's a vav, but it's discounted. And maybe that answers our question. Maybe that particular vav is deducted from the tally, and like we mentioned earlier, a vav is not one of the composite letters. And therefore, we had 600,001, because we had 599,990 with the composite letter calculation. We added 11 for the big letters, and that gives us one more than we needed. And now we're told the vav of the word shalom in numbers 2512 is deducted, and we end up with the magical number, precisely 600,000 letters in the Torah. Let's go back to one of our original questions. We asked, of course, at Sinai, the Jewish people, they got the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, well, they were uttered by God in this prophetic experience. And then they were forever etched onto the tablets. First tablets were destroyed. Second tablets endured. Well, if you look at Exodus and and Deuteronomy, the two times that it says the Ten Commandments, in Exodus it says, Zohar, Remember, the Shabbos to sanctify it. And in Deuteronomy, it says, Shamar, observe, guard the Shabbos to sanctify it. And the word Zachor and the word Shamar are different words. That was our question. So what did it say in the tablets? Now we have an, our answer. If you look at those two words, Zachor and Shamor, both of them have four letters, right? The word Zachor is a Zayin, a Chaf, a Vav, and a Resh. And the word shamar is a shin, a mem, a vav, and a resh. So they both have four letters. Moreover, the last two letters, the vav and the resh, are identical in both words. Zachor, shamar. Both of them end with a vav and a resh, and that makes the same sound. So the only difference between these two words is the first two letters. The word zachor has a zayin and a chaf, and the word shamar has a shin and a mem. Here we have our answer we discovered that certain letters are composite letters. And on a deep Kabbalistic level, embedded in every Aleph is a Vav and two Yuds. And every Tzadik is a Nun that's crouching over with the Yud on top of it. 
What about the word shamor? Shamor is a shin. Embedded in every shin is a zion. And the next letter of the word shamor is a mem. Embedded in every mem, a mem is two letters. It's got a chaf and a vav that's attached to the chaf. And therefore, if it says the word shamor, on a certain level, it also says the word zachor. Because again, every shin has a zion in it and every mem has a chaf in it. Isn't that amazing? It said the word shamar. But you know what? It also said the word zachor. I think an amazing idea emerges from this insight. There are 600,000 letters in the Torah. Precisely. Not one more, not one less. And you know what? We have a Torah scroll today. And if you count it the way that we just discussed of how to count it, we also have precisely 600,000 letters. Isn't that amazing? That we're able to perpetuate the Torah over the course of all kinds of turmoil and tumult and prosecution, persecution, exile, dispersal, various cultures and countries and all over the world. And what we've endured, of course, is well documented. And we still have the exact text that tallies up to the precise answer, to the precise number, 600,000 letters. But what this tells us is that every Jew, every Jewish soul, has its roots in the Torah. Moreover, the Jewish people, when they got to Sinai, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Negadahar, famous verse, one of the most famous Rashi's in the Torah, the Jewish nation encamped by the mountain. And the verse describes the nation in singular terms. It says Rashi, Ke'eshechad belevechad. At Sinai, the nation was united like one man with one purpose. There was no disparity between the people. They were united. They were together. They were fused as one person. What this tells us is, if there was one of the 600,000 that was not on board, then that corresponding soul's letter in the Torah would not have been conveyed. There's a transfer here. The Torah is in the heavens. It's coming down to the people below. But it's only coming down to the nation below if they are a perfect fit for the Torah. 600,000 souls, each eagerly anticipating and embracing the 600,000 thousand letters of the Torah. Only under those conditions can this transfer transpire. If one person said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not in. I'm not interested. Well, then that person's letter, so the corresponding letter, could not have descended. And therefore, the Jewish people would have gotten an incomplete Torah. And what happens when a Torah scroll is missing one letter? A Torah scroll is missing even one letter is invalidated. This is telling us a fascinating insight about the nation, the way they were before Sinai. Each Jew was incredibly valuable. Each Jew was incredibly necessary. Each Jew was indispensable. If there was one Jew that wasn't on board with the program, you have less than 600,000 letters, and therefore you have nothing. Without every single Jew signing up, signing on board, we don't have Shavuos, we don't have Sinai, we don't have Torah. So we originally began with the question, what's connected between the festival of Shavuos and the Parsha? What's our Parsha about? Our Parsha begins. Count the Jewish people. Every Jew matters. Every Jew's counting. Who's doing the counting? You may think, you know, let's hire a bureaucrat. Let's hire a paper pusher. Let's hire uh, an actuarial firm. Let's figure out, let's send out those, those, those census cards that we get in the mail every decade. That's what you may think. But the third verse of our parish tells us, no, Moshe and Aaron are counting every people. Every person is developing a relationship with Moshe and Aaron, two of the greatest people that ever, have ever lived. Each one of them is important. Each one of them matters. Each one of them is vital. Each one of them is necessary. Each one of them is indispensable. Moreover, on a deep level, Moshe 
He knows the Torah, of course, more than anyone else knew it, besides for God, right? And he is also a prophet. He's able to look right through a person. Moshe is able to identify every one of these 600,000 souls that he's encountering, that he's counting. He's identifying which letter in the Torah corresponds to them. And when he meets them, he says, you are needed, you are necessary, you are vital, you are important, and I know what exactly you need to do. This is not just let's count a bunch of people, let's 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 figure out how many soldiers we have, and you know what, let's have a margin of error because you know you can't do with things perfectly. Oh no, this is Moshe. Moshe is being hired for this job, and he's not just counting them randomly, he is elevating them, and he's telling them, You are so important, you are so necessary, you are so critical, without you we can't have Torah. Oh, and by the way, this is your letter in Torah. This is your role, your job, your mission, your objective in life. You're needed. You're incredible. You're indispensable. The Talmud tells us, Chayav Adam Lomar, a person is obligated, is required to say, Bishvili Nivra Ha'olam, the world created for me. Of course, that sounds very hubristic. It sounds... Very boastful. The entire world was created for me. Who says that? That's the lesson of our Parsha. Every person matters. Our actions matter. Our attitudes matter. Our behavior matters. Every mitzvah that we do spawns a good angel. Every sin God forbid that we do does the opposite. We're important. We're like angels. We have flags. But a lot of the Parsha is about the layout of the people. Where are they encamped? Which tribe is with which other tribe? And the various flags. And the Midrash tells us that the Jewish people at Sinai, they saw the angels, the heavenly legions, each one of them had a flag. They mattered. Jewish people in this Parsha, at Sinai, we matter too. We're like angels. We have God in our midst. We're important. We're needed. We're necessary. As we prepare for Sinai, we got to read for Torah. It's important for us to remember our souls that we have. Now, this is maybe a bit Kabbalistic because Kabbalistically, a soul is not kind of a singular thing. You can have a little, a little flicker of a soul, and that's part of the same kind of mega soul. In fact, according to the Kabbalah, there's only one soul, the soul of Adam. That's divided up initially into three, and that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then into 12, and then into 70, and then into 600,000. But we have within us that same spark, that same force that was at Sinai. We are intimately and inextricably connected to God. We're important. We matter. We could be the ones who harbor the Almighty's Torah. I want to end with a special treat. If you've endured until this point, you're the lucky one that gets to hear this. What's the idea behind having this letter in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, verse 12? This one letter, this one vav that's cut up. What's the idea behind that? Who does that correspond to? That's also part of the Torah. But we have 600,000 letters without it. So who does that correspond to? It's a good question. Maybe there's a lot of answers to this. But I remember seeing, I couldn't find this thing when I was looking for it. I was researching it for, for it. I remember seeing something fascinating, something mind-blowing. The word that has the cut-up vav is the word shalom, meaning peace. The vav is cut up, and the Talmud tells us that this vav of the word shalom, the word peace, this letter that's called up, it's called a vav ketia. Ketia means cut up. This is the Vav Ketia of the word Shalom. Now in the Talmud, we find an amazing story. And the character, the main character, the protagonist of this story in the Talmud is a non-Jew who is an advisor to Caesar. Caesar was, was one of the, we don't know exactly which Caesar it is, but it's one of the Roman emperors. And his name is Ketia 
bar shalom. Katia, again, the word katia, which means cut up. That is his first name, and his father's name, bar, which means the son of shalom. Again, we have a word shalom in Numbers 25, 12. And the vav, the third of the four letters of the word shalom is the vav. It's cut up, says Talmud, it's called a vav katia, a cut up vav. And then we meet a character in the Talmud, in the book of Avodazar, page 10b, whose name is Ketia Bar Shalom. And he's a non-Jew, and he works for the Caesar. And Caesar, and this would obviously give us a hard time to identify him, because there's a lot of Caesars that behave like this. This Caesar wants to destroy the Jewish people. He wants to make an edict and kill all the Jews. And this non-Jewish advisor, he says, well, you can't kill the Jewish people, and he brings a whole bunch of proofs why you can't kill the Jewish people. You're, you're going to be the one who's going to go down in, in infamy. You're going to be the one Roman emperor that kills your own citizens. He basically triumphs over him and he says he can't kill the Jewish people. So Caesar says, you know what? You're right. Can't kill the Jewish people. But you know who I could kill? I could kill you. Because you triumphed over the king. You triumphed over the emperor. You triumphed over Caesar. And that is inexcusable. And now I'm going to kill you. So they lead him to his death. And Talmud describes how one of the spectators started heckling Ketia Bar Shalom. And the spectator tells him, you're dying for the Jewish people, but you yourself are not a Jew. You're such a sucker. You're dying for the Jewish people, but you haven't paid the tax of joining the Jewish people. So Talmud describes that he grabbed a knife and he circumcised himself and he held up his foreskin and said, look, I paid my tax. And then they execute him. And the Talmud concludes that after he was killed, a prophetic voice announced, Katia Bar Shalom. This officer, this Roman advisor to the Caesar, is welcomed to Olamapa, is invited to the afterlife. His conversion, his circumcision as he's being led to his death made him join the Jewish people. He's now a convert and a righteous convert and he's welcomed into Olam We ask the question, if there's 600,000 in one letter in the Torah, couldn't we shave off one letter? Couldn't we have exactly 600,000 letters in the Torah corresponding to the exact number of Jews at Sinai 600,000 Jews? Maybe this is our answer. This vav ketia, this cut up vav in the word shalom, is hinting to the story of ketia bar shalom, to this convert who is going to be absorbed into the Jewish people, and he too finds his place in the Torah. In fact, the Talmud in the book of Shabbos, page 146a, tells us, that not only were the Jews at Sinai, the future Jews, the souls to come, were also present. And you know who else was there? The souls of future converts. And you may ask the question, the people who were at Sinai, well, they were the perfect match for the Torah that was given at Sinai. 600,000 corresponding to 600,000. Well, what about the souls of the future converts? Where were they represented in the Torah? Here's your answer. They're not part of the original 600,000. But they're hinted in that vav. It's not part of the 600,000, but it's still part of the Torah. They could come join and they too can retroactively find themselves at Sinai and be part of this heavenly transfer, 600,000 plus one vav that's cut up. They could join and they could be part of, of the people and part of this mission and part of the indispensable nation that's here representing God in this world. So that's the idea. The idea is, both in our Parsha and in the upcoming festival, there is a common theme. And the common theme is, our nation is cherished. Our nation is indispensable. We are needed. We are the mightiest people representing Him in the world. And for Torah, for us to accept Torah, all of us have to be on board. And the Talmud tells us, the book of Psachim, page 68b, that the great Rabbi Yosef, the great sage of the Talmudic era, 
on every Shavuos, he would make the following declaration. Let's celebrate. Let's have a feast. Because you know what? If not for Torah, if not for Shavuos, and if not for Sinai, there are a lot of ordinary Joes. There's a lot of ordinary Yosis in the marketplace. This is the time of the year. This is the time of us becoming special and us recognizing that we matter and us making the declaration, the world's created for me, the world's created for Torah, and Torah needs me on board. And we have to realize this, of course, is an amazing responsibility as well. We have to be committed to the cause. We have to be on board because so long as there are Jews of this 600,000 group that are not on board, our nation and the world is not complete. May we all merit to recognize the unique specialness of who we are and what we represent. And may we experience the best Shavuos and the best Parshas by Midbar that we've ever had. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Volby. This is the podcast that we do. My email address is rabbiwolbygmail.com. And again, as I mentioned at the top, if you want to join the class of people that are saying, we're on board, we're partnering with Torch, we're partnering with all these amazing podcasts spreading Torah throughout the world, and we want to do it on an ongoing basis, you are elevated to that rarefied class, to that supporter that's with us through thick and thin. Stay safe, stay sane, and we'll talk again soon. Shalom.